Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. In October 2015, the Omohundro Institute became the primary U.S. partner for the Georgian Papers program. The Georgian Papers consist of manuscripts, letters, maps, and other documents created by members of the British court during the reigns of King George I through King George IV. These papers are invaluable and hard to gain access to, but the Omohundro Institute is helping scholars gain access to them through its partnership and fellowship programs. Finn Coretta, a professor of English at the University of Maryland, served as the inaugural senior fellow of the Georgian Papers program. When I asked Vin about his experiences, he told me what having access to the collection meant for his research and what his expertise meant for the archivists who work on the collection. This is an archive that I've been fantasizing about getting access to for maybe 30 years because I've always wondered you know, what's in there, especially in relationship to the people that I've been working on. One of the people that I've worked on is named Atoba Kuguano, and he was enslaved in Africa, brought to the New World, and eventually found his way to England, where he entered the employ of Richard Cosway. And Richard Cosway was the principal painter to the Prince Regent, the future George IV. And Kuguano's book, he wrote an anti-slavery book that he published in 1787, and he had some letters in another archive in the Gloucestershire Record Office, one of which is a letter to the Prince of Wales. And it's clearly a letter that would have accompanied a presentation copy of his book. So I was wondering whether they had a copy of his book in the Royal Library. And indeed, they had. They didn't realize that it was a presentation copy. So I told them who Kuguana was, how he was connected to the Prince of Wales through Richard Causeway. So I think everybody came out of that happy. The Omohundro Institute, fostering collaboration between historians and archivists and facilitating access to historical collections. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's world will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 75 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Where do historians research history? In episode 70, Jennifer Morgan revealed how historians research history. They track historical sources to archives. But how do you gain access to an archive? And how do you use an archive once you find that it likely contains the information you seek? In this third episode of our Doing History series, we investigate how archives work so we can better understand how historians work and how they come to know what they know about the past. Our guide for this exploration is Peter Drummey, an archivist and the Stephen T. Riley Librarian of the Massachusetts Historical Society. During our investigation, Peter reveals details about the founding of the Massachusetts Historical Society, which is the oldest historical society in the United States, the work archivists perform and how their work influences the way historians use historical materials, and a behind-the-scenes look at some of the Massachusetts Historical Society's collections, which include the papers of Paul Revere and the personal papers of Thomas Jefferson. Ready to explore how archives and archivists help historians do history? Let's go meet our guest archivist. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an archivist and the Stephen T. Riley Librarian at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Over the last 38 years, he has acquired an encyclopedic knowledge of the Society's collections. He has also assisted many historians and history lovers alike with finding the information they seek. Today, he joins us as part of our Doing History, How Historians Work series to reveal how archives work. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Peter Drummy. My pleasure. It seems fitting that we explore how archives work with the archivist of the Massachusetts Historical Society, because founded in 1791, the Massachusetts Historical Society, or MHS, is the oldest historical society in the United States. Peter, would you tell us about the founding of the MHS? After the Revolution, 
here in Boston, Massachusetts, there was concern that the history of the revolution would be lost as the revolutionary generation died away. So only eight years after the formal peace that ended the revolution in 1791, 10 men came together in Boston to found the Historical Society. We have the luxury that they produced a birth announcement for the Historical Society, as they then called it. So let me just tell you what they said their purpose was. Um, Read it to you. A society has lately been instituted in this town, that is Boston, called the Historical Society, the professed design of which is to collect, preserve, and communicate materials for a complete history of this country and accounts of all the valuable efforts of human ingenuity and industry from the beginning of its settlement. Peter, if the founding goal of the MHS was to collect, preserve, and communicate a complete history of this country, does that mean that the collections of the Massachusetts Historical Society extend beyond the history of Massachusetts? Yes, that's exactly right. And in fact, their name when they were founded was simply the Historical Society. There were no others. They were incorporated in 1794 under the name Massachusetts Historical Society. But even then, the purpose has remained, at least through the first century of the history of the Historical Society, when there were a few other repositories collecting historical records, that purpose was clearly to document the history of the nation, not simply the history of Massachusetts. Although, to be fair, we've always held most material about the history of Massachusetts in New England. Every archive has an archival focus. What would you say the archival focus of the MHS is? There are different definitions of what archives are, but if we think of them as being repositories for records, and that can be a wide range of materials of permanent or enduring value, the Massachusetts Historical Society is primarily a manuscript repository. That is, we hold the personal papers of individuals and families. We have the records of organizations, a wide range of supporting materials, but at its heart, the Massachusetts Historical Society is a manuscript repository. Peter, now that we know how an archive functions as a manuscript repository, Would you tell us how archives differ from libraries? I think while there are uh, narrow technical definitions for what archives are, simply stated, an archive holds records, materials, again, that are of uh, permanent value, but are, in most instances, materials that haven't been duplicated, um, in our case, manuscripts, unpublished letters and diaries and documents. And a library collects materials based upon printed works that are, in most instances, not unique. And library collections are artificial, that is, selected, book by book, collected to make a collection, whereas archives usually are attempts to collect materials that have a single creator or creators, either an individual or a family or an organization, and to keep those records in order, that is, take into account their provenance, how they were created. So you keep someone's personal papers together as a collection rather than distribute uh, letters in different collections, or you don't have all of one type of document together as an artificial collection, but keep things together because how things were created informs about the material as well as the intellectual contents of them. Would you tell us about the work archivists do and how it is similar or different from the work of librarians? I mean, you're an archivist, but your title is that of librarian. Yes, that has to do with our very early founding. That is, the Massachusetts Historical Society being founded in the 18th century, this modern nomenclature of archives and archivists hadn't come into um, wide use. The term archive is very old, has a Greek origin going back to classical Greece, the idea of archons being magistrates. And in their place of work, the archive, there would be records stored. But the modern use of the term archives uh, certainly existed in the English language, but the modern use really dates from the French Revolution and the development of the French National Archives, which is exactly contemporaneous with the founding of the Massachusetts Historical Society. I think the French National Archives dates from during the French Revolution from 1790. So we have taken this name 
an existing name, and embarked on a what was a relatively new enterprise at the end of the 18th century. So what we do here, we have books and pamphlets and newspapers and the whole range of things that you might find in a research library. But again, the bulk of our holdings are collections of manuscripts, millions of pages arranged in thousands of collections. And the people that work with them, and some of this work clearly is connected and overlaps with what librarians do. Nevertheless, the work is in some respects quite different in its approach to the material that we collect. Archivists appraise materials, that is, not determining their financial value, but their historical value. We acquire materials, we arrange and describe them, gain intellectual control over them, process them, as we say in the field. We describe them, either overviews of the collections or inventories of them in archives usually referred to as finding aids for collections. We're involved in the preservation of these materials, keeping them in secure secure facilities with climate control that maintains their long life, and then we provide access to them. In a business or an institution, it might be the staff of the organization who are the primary users. In a place like a historical society, like the Massachusetts Historical Society, it's historical researchers who come here who are our primary audience. Archivists arrange and describe collections. Does the archivist's arrangement and description of a collection affect how researchers use archival materials? This is one of the primary problems that we face, the challenges that collections, especially as we move on into the modern era, are enormous in size. So gaining physical control of them, that is ensuring their arrangement, is a challenge in its own right. But then providing descriptive information to them is even more complicated because the overall description of a collection might be concise and straightforward. But making it clear what the contents are when it would be extraordinarily challenging to systematically review each piece in a collection means that we have to reach a balance between efficiency, getting overviews of collections available to the public in a reasonable time frame, and providing the sort of description that allows people to search for subjects covered within a collection, especially when they lie in papers that might not be obvious even to a well-informed researcher. Does the Massachusetts Historical Society have a process to achieve that balance between efficiency and describing what is in a given collection? We have a process, but that process evolves over time. I've been working here almost 40 years, and when I came to the Massachusetts Historical Society, it was the case that most of the focus was on describing individual documents in collections so that the sensibility was provide information so someone interested in an important event in American history or an important person in American history, that information would be available. I think what was seen as being important was where do documents on this subject lie within the collection was the central focus of description rather than what is the collection and what does it contain, the overview of the separate collections. So there's been a substantial movement here, but in all archival repositories, to more focus on the description of bodies of material rather than individual documents. That is, more focus on the forests and perhaps less on the trees within it. That's a balance that has to be achieved. Too much movement in one direction is going to be a disservice. So moving entirely away from the description of individual documents is probably a cure that's as problematic as what it was attempting to overcome. It's also the case that there's a sensibility now within the field of archival research and the work of archivists that making things available in relatively rapid fashion is important in its own right, that the perfect can be the enemy of the good, that a minimal level of description then makes materials available to researchers may be better than the uh, long-term devotion to providing very detailed information about materials that at the same time makes them unavailable for research. 
Let's explore the evolution of another MHS process. The Reverend Jeremy Belknap started collecting manuscripts for the Massachusetts Historical Society in a quest to document the American experience. Peter, would you tell us how the MHS started collecting manuscripts, rare books, and other printed materials? And how has its collection process evolved over the last 225 years? I think in an organization that's 225 years old, as the Historical Society is this year, what you see is not a direct path from its founding to the present, a direct line. But I think most organizations reflect this. That is, changes over time in enthusiasm and interest and levels of energy and what the focus is on. So at its beginnings, the focus of the Historical Society was on collecting. Jeremy Belna left us our watchword that we should ever be faithful to. That is, there's nothing like having a good repository, he said, and we've tried to do that over our entire uh, history, but also not that it was necessary to go out like a wolf for the prey, as he put it. That is, it was necessary to go out and seek out material. You didn't wait for material to come to you, um, no matter how wonderful your organization was, but made a real sincere effort to track it down and accumulate it and bring it under the roof of the organization. Jeremy Belknap famously went to Connecticut in the 1790s, soon after the founding of the Historical Society, and this is probably some legend has come into the story, but went to the home of a recently deceased governor of Connecticut and more or less um, came back to Boston with a wagon full of papers that had been accumulated by the former governor of Connecticut, including what turned out to be some of the um, official records of Connecticut that made their way to Massachusetts and then were re patriated to Connecticut in the 19th century. But what I think he would have thought is what's important is to collect and preserve. And because preservation was not understood in modern terms, his idea, the founder's idea of preservation was to multiply the copies since they didn't know a way to ensure the long-term preservation of documents, what they did is systematically transcribed and published documents so that no catastrophe could eliminate the intellectual contents of them. They would be preserved by these multiple copies. The Massachusetts Historical Society has digitized over 40 collections or resources that anyone with internet access can view. Tom would like to know how archives determine what collections they digitize. So Peter, would you tell us about the MHS's digitized collections? How and why did it decide to digitize these specific collections? Now, here's another case where thinking has evolved, even over the relatively brief time that institutions have been digitizing documents from their collections. I think when we started out, and this is now going towards 20 years ago, our idea was that we would essentially provide through our website a sampling of our holdings, make people aware of the kinds of things that we held rather than systematically digitize documents. With aid from the federal government, a program called Save America's Treasures, we were able to digitize a systematic online archive of the letters of John and Abigail Adams, the cornerstone of a much larger family collection here, but a collection where there was wide popular interest and not only provide the contents through the transcriptions, but also digital facsimiles so people could understand what the documents that they were looking at online, in fact, looked like. And then along with that, we provided copies of uh, John Adams's diaries and the unpublished autobiography that he wrote later on in life, that that material about his life would be available. So people could see the personal papers behind the relatively well-known and understood public story of their lives. Before we explore some of the MHS's rich archival holdings, I'd like to discuss objectivity. No matter how objective historians try to be, the present influences the way they interpret the past. Peter, is the same true for archives? Does the present influence how archivists preserve and catalog archival materials? Yes, this is a very important point. It's in changing views of 
the past, changes in the character of historical research influence what archivists collect, but I'd say even more profoundly, they influence the interpretation of materials that have already been collected so that in the 20th century, with the rise of the interest in social and family history, a place like the Massachusetts Historical Society that collected systematically large bodies of family and personal papers. Um, had collected those documents along one axis that sort of tell the history of the United States and the actions of individuals and historical events, uh, political and military events over the course of American history, found that it had, by that collecting, assembled this enormous archive of family and personal papers, which have turned out to be enormously useful for studying a range of other topics, focusing on family, um, women's history, uh, immigration history, where that's reflected in personal papers. Also, in personal papers, where people who are not necessarily literate in the past who didn't leave records of their own, where they appear in the personal papers of individuals and families. So there's that sort of effort to sort of reinterpret its existing collections. I can give a good example. It's from printed material, but from my own experience here, when I first came to the Massachusetts Historical Society, I discovered there was a large body of pamphlet material that had been deaccessioned, removed from the collection to be a sold or exchanged with other institutions. This had taken place at the time of the Second World War, but the materials had been removed from the collection, but not removed from the building. That is, they were in a sort of long-term limbo. Going through them, what was clear was that what had been removed from the collection as being extraneous or of less interest back earlier in the 20th century had been the reports of social welfare organizations, ephemeral literature in pamphlets. In fact, what was of great interest to historians working at the time I made this discovery, it, was, it wasn't a discovery in the sense that I knew what people were coming to the Historical Society looking for. I found we had it, but I found that a previous generation of people working here had thought that that material was of little or no interest. So we could reintegrate it into our collection, but that decision was entirely driven by the current use in the 1970s. It wasn't that I was smarter than a previous generation of people working here. I was just aware what a, another generation of historians was working on and what materials they needed to do that research. Now that we have an idea of how archives and archivists work, Let's explore some of the MHS's rich holdings. The Massachusetts Historical Society holds the papers of Paul Revere. This collection contains three different documents by Paul Revere that describe the ride he made on April 18, 1775. Peter, would you tell us about Paul Revere's midnight ride and about these three documents? I mean, why did Revere need to write his account three times? Well, in chronology, they're sort of in backwards order. That is, it's not our earliest document, but I think an account that Paul Revere wrote to the Historical Society in 1798, only a few years after we have found it, in fact, shows what the founders of the Historical Society set out to do. In 1798, the corresponding secretary of the Historical Society, uh, Jeremy Belknap, writes to Paul Revere, who's a successful businessman, business entrepreneur in Boston after the revolution, and essentially asked him what about the events that led up to the beginning of the revolution. And again, I'll just read the first paragraph of a wonderful letter he, Paul Revere, writes to the Historical Society. Uh, Sir, having a little leisure, I wish to fulfill my promise of giving you some facts and anecdotes prior to the Battle of Lexington, which I do not remember to have seen in any history of the American Revolution. And then in eight more closely written pages, manuscript pages, Revere tells us pretty much all we know of his ride. It wasn't a famous ride until he wrote out this letter to the Historical Society. And what's interesting about this, he gives us the background the events leading up to the beginning of the revolution as well. So it's, an, it's a personal narrative of what he saw and observed on April 18th, but also the background to it. And then at the end of the letter, he goes on to speculate about some of the unanswered questions about the revolution. 
Now, a historian looking at this today would say, well, there's a couple of things about this letter. One is he wrote this letter in 1798, almost 25 years after the event that he was describing. How much reliance can we place on his memory of those events? But apart from this letter written directly to the Massachusetts Historical Society, which is in the Historical Society's own records, its own archives as an institution, we also acquired in the 1950s Paul Revere's family papers, which are essentially a, an archive of family business from his work as a gold and silver smith before the revolution on through the early 19th century. But in that collection of family papers, were a draft, that is a rough note in the form of a narrative that he wrote out, and then a fair copy where he copied over in manuscript his notes to make a clear copy of an affidavit that he wrote out in the immediate aftermath of his ride, that is early in the spring of 1775, where he gives an account of what had happened. So this would have been an account he wrote shortly after the battles of Lexington and Concord, and probably written as the revolutionary government of Massachusetts, which was just coming into being, was gathering these accounts of the battles that began the revolution to use to show it had been the, the patriot forces in the countryside who had been attacked by the ministerial troops, as they were then calling them, coming out of Boston so that the purpose of these two accounts is quite different. But it does tell us that when he wrote this narrative in 1798 for the Historical Society, Revere had this manuscript account he had written almost 25 years before to refer back to. So the details in the account don't differ much. What's really interesting is to see the difference in emphasis. Some small things, like when I just mentioned, in 1775, it was the ministerial troops who were marching out of Boston to Lexington and Concord. In 1798, it was the British who were marching out of Boston. This division and the aftermath of the revolution became clear-cut. Also in 1775, the account is very matter-of-fact and to the point, although it has within it a striking account of how Revere had been briefly captured during the course of his ride, returned to Lexington just in time to witness the outbreak of fighting there on Lexington Green. And both in his draft and his fair copy written in 1775, he makes explicit reference to the commander on Lexington Green of the militia forces saying not to fire, to make the ministerial troops start any sort of fighting there. And then um, almost immediately after, there is an outbreak of firing. In 1798, that doesn't seem to be as an important point to Revere. And what he's more concerned about is giving the details of how there was great concern in Boston just when the revolution began, that somehow the British had a spy within the leadership of the Patriot movement and were gaining information about what the plans of the Patriots were. He's teasing apart the story of Dr. Benjamin Church, who was exactly that figure, a person who is at the head of the revolutionary leadership, what became the revolutionary leadership, nevertheless in the pay of the uh, British government. So there's this differences in detail and emphasis, but these three documents together allow us to get a fairly vivid picture of this event. There's one more interesting point. At the end of the account written for the Massachusetts Historical Society, a Revere who has, I think, somewhat the reputation of being a self-promoter, and some of that's probably deserved. He writes at the end of his letter written to the Historical Society not to use his name if they published his account, but to sign him a Son of Liberty from 1775. And in the manuscript, that's crossed out by Jeremy Belknap, who edited this letter for publication. And it simply says, Colonel Revere's letter. And that's how the Historical Society published it. So, so much for the intent of the author. We have this. Most people have read this published as being the straightforward account by Paul Revere, not knowing that his intention was to sort of make people aware of these events without calling attention to himself necessarily. Paul Revere's accounts of his ride are important. Not only do they describe his ride, but these documents also show how Revere's present influenced the way he viewed the past. 
Peter, how do the archivists at the MHS work to ensure that important documents like Revere's will be around for researchers to use for years to come? There are really three things that are important to think about. There are questions of preservation. That is, you have to store documents written on paper under conditions that ensure their long life. That is, control relative humidity and temperature, have a system to prevent and suppress fire, which is a great danger to documents. These questions of physical security are extraordinarily important. That is, going back to Jeremy Belknap, there's nothing like having a good repository. And then there is conservation. And the distinction there is that while the paper Paul Revere's letters or any letters from the 18th century were written on is of a very high quality. This is rags pounded to pieces to make paper. So it has a very high cotton content. Nevertheless, this is paper that's often become acidic or stained or discolored over time. Now, there's much that can be done to repair, deacidify, and clean documents. And we have a a conservation laboratory in our building to do that. So there's long-term preservation, there's conservation to improve the physical condition of documents. And then we're here to make things available to the public, but we're also the custodians of things of immeasurable value so that in this instance, while the Historical Society published Paul Revere's letter back at the end of the 18th century, and it's been available in a transcribed and imperfect transcription all the time since, now these are the kinds of documents, his affidavits and his letter, that we digitize, transcribe, and make available at our website so that a large number of people, researchers, can see these documents without having to necessarily handle them. And so that we've protected them by the physical conditions in which they're stored, but also protected them by making them available in another format than their original form. And trying to do that in, with the most accurate transcription that we can. Something that may surprise you about the Massachusetts Historical Society is that they hold one of the largest collections of papers by Thomas Jefferson. The Coolidge Collection of Thomas Jefferson Manuscripts contains nearly 9,500 documents. Peter, would you tell us about the Coolidge Collection of Thomas Jefferson Manuscripts and how these documents came into the possession of the Massachusetts Historical Society? Well, the Coolidge Collection came to the Massachusetts Historical Society as a family story, a love story. Thomas Jefferson, in retirement after he left the presidency in 1809, retired to Monticello and lived there, surrounded by his extended family. A daughter and grandchildren lived there with him. And in 1824, towards the end of his life, he was visited, as he was visited by had hundreds of people come to call upon him. In fact, later on in life, he built a retreat from Monticello, Poplar Forest, where he could get away from his many visitors, at least briefly. But nevertheless, in 1824, a young man from Massachusetts, Joseph Coolidge, made one of these calls upon Thomas Jefferson with a letter of introduction, uh, essentially wanting to lay eyes on this great figure from the time of the revolution. And uh, Joseph Coolidge was very impressed by Jefferson, but even more by a granddaughter, Ellen Wales Randolph, who lived at Monticello, one of Jefferson's grandchildren, who acted as his assistant, sort of as his secretary in old age. And Ellen, who was considered the belle of Monticello, it was supposed she would never marry because she was so attached to her grandfather, so close to him. Nevertheless, Joseph Coolidge came along. She caught his eye. He returned to Monticello later. And in 1825, they were married in the parlor of Monticello, moved back to Massachusetts, to Boston, where they raised six children and named their youngest son, Thomas Jefferson Coolidge. And Thomas Jefferson Coolidge and his son of the same name, Thomas Jefferson Coolidge Jr., and his son of the same name, Thomas Jefferson Coolidge III, on through four generations, members of the Coolidge family assembled Jefferson's personal papers, Jefferson's public papers as governor of Virginia and envoy to France and secretary of state, vice president, president, were purchased from his descendants and are at the Library of Congress. So Jefferson Jefferson's public papers are owned by the United States and at the Library of Congress. But a vast archive of Jefferson's 
personal papers were acquired and assembled by his Coolidge descendants here in Massachusetts, and through a series of gifts starting in 1898, came to the Massachusetts Historical Society. So that we have thousands of copies of letters that Jefferson wrote as a private citizen copies he made when he sent his letters out, thousands of letters that he received in his capacity as a private citizen, and then manuscript records of the operation of Monticello and other properties he owned, both as an agricultural enterprise and also as a great experimental garden where he'd attempt to introduce and grow hundreds of different varieties of crops to America. He also was the architect of his own home, famously Monticello, but also other buildings, both private dwellings and public buildings as well. There are more than 400 architectural drawings by Jefferson here in our collection. So there's this enormous personal archive here. And again, to go back to how we interpret things, these materials were all collected as the personal papers of this extraordinarily important person in American history. But as an agricultural enterprise in 18th and early 19th century Virginia, Monticello was essentially an enterprise built by and maintained by an enormous number of enslaved people, Jefferson's human property. He owned hundreds of slaves over the course of his life so that here's a good example of where you have someone's personal papers, but it's this very vivid and detailed account of agricultural enterprise, a true true plantation slavery in the period following the American Revolution contained in these personal papers. 9,500 documents sounds like a lot of paper. How do archivists set about cataloging and arranging manuscript collections like the Coolidge Collection for researchers to use? Well, in this instance, in preparing a finding aid, you start out with background information, a much uh, more concise description of how we acquired these papers, how their broad physical arrangement, that is, loose manuscripts, correspondence arranged in chronological order, and then the separate files of memorandum books and library records. Jefferson has a wonderful manuscript catalog to his own personal library to be sold to the United States, but into a series of subcategories and then more detailed information about different parts of the collection. This collection was microfilmed back in the 1940s, right when that technology first came into use, as again, with uh, generous support from the Coolidge family, so that the project to systematically publish Thomas Jefferson's papers, which began at Princeton University in the 1950s, could get underway. That is, they didn't try to physically acquire and assemble Jefferson's papers, but make systematic copies of them that could be brought together and used by documentary editors. Now, the project at Princeton has been underway for more than 60 years and has documented Jefferson's life up through the first years of his presidency. A second project is underway at Monticello to document the last years of Jefferson's life from the time of his retirement from the presidency in 1809 till his death in 1826. But those enormous editorial projects are built upon the contributions of the Library of Congress, the Massachusetts Historical Society, and the other repositories that hold Jefferson papers. Because in addition to the enormous collection of the Coolidge collection of Thomas Jefferson papers, this enormous family archive, there are in the collections of the Massachusetts Historical Society hundreds of other Jefferson documents scattered through collections, all of the letters that he wrote over the course of his life to John Abigail Adams are within the Adams family papers. This is this respect for provenance. If I write you a letter, my letter is in your papers so that we don't take Jefferson's letters out of the Adams papers and assemble them artificially into a collection, but leave them where they lie as they were received and then use references to them to make people aware where else there are Jefferson materials. 
so that this finding aid, Guide to the Jefferson Papers, guides people to their use here. It's also available online, so someone making plans to come and visit the Massachusetts Historical Society to look at Jefferson Papers can tell how large the collection is and how it's organized. As I say to people who work in this field, when you set out to visit a a repository, you want to know whether you're going for a day, a week, a month, or the rest of your life and to make a reasonable plan for your work. It's also the case that because we have digitized much of the Coolidge collection now, we can sort of have links within the finding aid to where those digital images of architectural drawings, of farm and garden records, of the manuscript of Notes in the State of Virginia, Jefferson's only sustained published writings, where those lie in the collection. And you're able to go right to those and to transcriptions of many of them at our website. These tips for how to use a finding aid are helpful because Michael would like to visit an archive someday, but he's never visited one before. Do you have any other advice for those who have never researched in an archive? How should they prepare for their first trip and what should they expect when they get there? I would encourage everyone who has an interest in history to visit an archive. I think it's an exposure to another part of this world of historical research, which is less familiar to many people. I think you'll find now that many archival institutions provide information about preparing for a visit at their website, provide a registration form you can download and print out to have ready. Most places are going to require that a visitor have some sort of current identification to prove that they are who they say they are as a matter of protection of the material in the collection. I think that there's often important information about hours of operation. Many institutions are in the circumstance where they have to store materials off-site. The Massachusetts Historical Society's collection is now so large that about a third of our holdings are stored off-site. For people who are interested in Benjamin Franklin's world, most of the materials that we hold from the 18th and early 19th century, going back to the 17th century, are here on site. But nevertheless, our online catalog and our online finding aids would make clear which of those things are held off site and need to be requested in advance of a visit, which is much easier to do now because you can order them online and they'll be in hand when you arrive for a visit. It's also the case that while the procedures in archives in many instances are the same from one to the other, balancing the ease of use with security of the collections, they differ enough from one repository to another to have an idea of what those might be. For someone who hasn't worked in an archives setting before, I'd say that the main differences are that you don't browse collections and select the materials that you're interested in viewing in almost every instance except for reference materials or materials that have been digitized or microfilmed. The circumstances where you're requesting materials from closed stack storage, which are retrieved to be used under supervision in a reading room. It's also the case in most archival settings, you have to be prepared to be deprived of all your worldly goods when you enter. That is, for security reasons, archivists are usually want to make sure that the materials you're bringing into a reading room, your lab top computer, usually requiring to use pencils so you don't leave any indelible ink marks on documents. Those sort of procedures are clearly explained either by form or in person by an archivist when you arrive. The only suggestion to have that are more subjective is, I think, If you have the time to do so, it's almost always beneficial to give notice of your planned visit, even if the repository by statements of its procedures says that no advance warning of a visit is necessary. It simply um, protects you against something that's come up at the last minute or a person on the staff that you should be sure to speak to. It's almost always the case within a repository that there'll be members of the staff who have additional or expert subject knowledge of what you're working on. And it's worth knowing who that is and if possible 
possible speaking to that person or those persons. So this is um, a little bit more elaborate and complicated than visiting your local library or even your school or university library. Nevertheless, I think with a little more preparation, they'll have a more satisfactory experience. I also think that if it's possible, it's often uh, worthwhile visiting a repository uh, more or less to get the lay of the land without planning to try to accomplish much by way of research at the time of that first visit. Sometimes I think people try to plunge into seeing the things that they've set out to do research on without getting enough of a feeling for the overall function of the organization or advice from the staff about where else in the collection useful information might lie. Could any interested history lover, like Michael, use the collections of the Massachusetts Historical Society, or must researchers possess a professional credential? The Massachusetts Historical Society is open to the public without charge. We're here six days a week. And for security reasons, uh, a person should have some sort of current identification when they register, but that's really all that's necessary to arrange for a visit. There are other institutions, specialized institutions, archives, where there's special handling requirements or use requirements. Many archival institutions, it's worth remembering, are departments of an institution so that their primary focus is on serving their institution. They may provide information to researchers, but that's not where their focus lies. In those instances, having a prior appointment or having a credential, an academic credential, or some sort of demonstration that it's necessary for your research to use materials is important. But I think that most people would be surprised that most archival institutions are welcoming to the public. In some respects, we're more evangelical on our side of the desk, so to speak, want to reach out to people. And so that you find that archives now are focusing more on exhibiting materials from their collections or having a range of public programs to increase a broad public awareness of what we do. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Peter, in your opinion, what might have happened if Jeremy Belknap had not been interested in documenting the American experience. How would the history of the Massachusetts Historical Society and of American archives be different today? This is a very interesting question, and it's probably a broad answer and a narrow answer. So let me go broad first. It's very hard to imagine the Massachusetts Historical Society becoming the organization it is today with its very wide-ranging collecting policy and outreach to the public in its very early founding date without Jeremy Belknap at the center of that story. Remove him, and it's very hard for me to imagine the Massachusetts Historical Society coming into a existence as early as it did, or with that idea that it's collecting the national history, that it's not a more narrowly focused state historical organization. Most state historical societies throughout the United States are much more focused on the history of their state. Many state historical societies are branches of the state government because they were founded at a later date when that was seen as a government function. The very early founding date of the Massachusetts Historical Society and most of the historical societies along the eastern seaboard is so early that they predate the idea of collecting historical records being a government function. So Jeremy Belknap is extremely important in that story. The problem, I would say, is, and what makes this, to me, a doubly interesting story, is that he does, in some respects, reflect a kind of heroic view of American history in his person. That is, you know, the founding genius. Without him, there would have been no historical society. And that I think is probably putting too much 
credit and weight on his shoulders. And what's happened, which I think is a real misfortune, is nine other interesting founders of the Massachusetts Historical Society and a whole range of interesting members from both the founding period and ever since have been sort of lost in this story of the heroic founder, Jeremy Belknap. So he's extraordinarily important, but I think in some respects maybe has become too important in creating our founding myth as an organization. Would you tell us if the Massachusetts Historical Society has any interesting exhibitions or special events planned at present or in the near future? We have, through May 26th of this year, an exhibition of the wonderful Jefferson materials we were speaking about as part of our celebration of our 225th anniversary. We decided that we would show perhaps the most famous collection we hold that's least known to the public, what's essentially hiding in plain sight in our collection here in the back bay of Boston, this treasure trove of Jefferson materials. So we have an exhibition on the private Jefferson as reflected in his personal papers and correspondence here through May 26. Following that, we're going to have an exhibition that will run through the remainder of our anniversary year, 2016, which will be examples of where individuals in their correspondence or diaries or other personal papers either witnessed or reflected on epical moments in American history, on transformational moments, so that we'll display the pen that Lincoln used to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, this remarkable artifact. But what we're really calling attention to is that Charles Sumner, senator from Massachusetts, ardent abolitionist, was there to witness Lincoln signing the Emancipation Proclamation. So this turning point in American history as reflected in the sort of personal story of an individual who played a part or witnessed an event. Where is the best place to look for more information about the Massachusetts Historical Society and how we can get in contact with you if we have more questions about the MHS or how archives work? The easiest way to get in touch with us or and see what we do is to go to our website, MassHist. M-A-S-S-H-I-S-T dot O-R-G, masshist.org. And there at our homepage, there's information about a calendar of events, our present and upcoming exhibitions, a whole range of activities that are open to the public, not just our library, but seminars and lectures and book signings that take place here at the Historical Society, a direct link to our online catalog, which is named Abigail, which supposedly stands for Automated Bibliographic something or another, but it's in fact named for Abigail Adams. And then there'll be contact information for all the members of our staff by department. And if you search under my name, Peter Drummy, you'll get both my email address and my direct telephone number. And as I hope I've indicated, this is a subject of much interest to me. And I'm always happy to help people either with finding out about materials in our collections or guiding people to the person on our staff who can be most helpful or talking about this larger world of historical manuscripts and archives. Peter, thank you so much for taking us through how archivists and archives work. It's my pleasure. Archivists appraise, acquire, arrange, describe, preserve, and provide access to materials. Their work helps historians access information about the past and affects how historians interact with that information. Doing history involves a lot of collaboration. Archivists help maintain the materials historians use for their research, and they provide historians with access to those collections. In turn, historians help archivists. They help archivists better understand the significance of the information within their collections and how that information contributes to our understanding of the past. You can find more information about the Massachusetts Historical Society, its collections and events, plus how to contact Peter on the show notes page benfranklinsworld.com slash 075. The Doing History series is made possible thanks to a partnership with the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. The Omohundro Institute helps scholars gain access to archives, and it fosters collaborations between scholars and archivists. For more information about the Omohundro Institute and their Georgian Papers program, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OI, or click the link in your Ben Franklin's World app. If you love episodes in the Doing History series, you'll be glad to know that future episodes will air on the last Tuesday of each month throughout 2016. 
For a complete list of Doing History episodes, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash doinghistory. Finally, what aspect of how archives work would you like to know more about? Or what archives do you have on your wish list to visit? Send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page for this episode or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.